Hello, welcome to the first of our Radical Visions for Social Care podcasts. And our special guest today is Simon Duffy, who is heading up the Citizen Network based in Sheffield, but extending its arms into uh, all parts global. of the world. Global. Yeah, yeah. And we hope that Simon will join us on, on more than one of these uh, podcasts in the in the next week while. We do, the three of us, share a history mm. which um, is overlapping and interconnected and still continuing uh, to this day. So uh, in this first uh, bit of today's podcast, we're just going to share a wee bit of, of, and maybe tell each other things that we don't know about each other as well, which would be interesting. So we thought we'd th start with you, Simon, and just the three of us started to work together around about 90, 1995, 1996, but we obviously had lives before then. <laughs> and it uh, uh, be interesting just to hear a wee bit about your story and, and where you grew up and your family background, that kind of thing. Oh, well, thanks for having me on your podcast. John and Francis, exciting. <laughs> this new crazy world. Yeah. Um, yes. Well, um, I, I suppose my my family I think of as the Duffies are kind of Manchester Irish, so they came. Um, I, my family come from Manchester originally, but I've lived in all sorts of parts of the north of England, and probably gr the longest place I lived was Durham, uh, the city of Durham, and um, then I went to university in Edinburgh. And uh, part of my kind of long love affair with Scotland and and Edinburgh and other things in Scotland. Um, and, Brothers and uh, sisters, I, Simon. Yeah, I've got two sisters: Ruth, who lives in Italy now, yeah. um, and Jenny, who lives in France. And I've got a dad who lives in France, um, who's coming to us for Christmas, and a mum who we just saw that last weekend, um, who lives in now in Ludlow. So I have to keep pointing out I'm the only one who's stayed in the north. <laughs> Everybody else has left, and uh, I guess that. But maybe, maybe as uh, Irish, our Irish roots, there's a lot of travelling that goes on. Yeah. If you look up Duffy in some dictionary, it says inveterate tinker. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I didn't mean. I remember a really good story, Simon, about you talking about somebody that had your name that. The police were looking for. Yes, yes. Do you remember that? <laughs> yes, I've been arrested a couple been of times. Arrested. That's right, because of some other Simon Duffy. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, and I get stopped at um, passport control all the time, and then somebody explained it's because your your name is a person of interest. And so, so yes, that, it's a real that person, hasn't, that person hasn't changed their ways in the last thirty years. Oh no, well, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, there may be more than one, <laughs> given the Duffy reputation. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, well, that's right. Here we are. So there's another Simon Duffy that's even more infamous. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, I don't know. My n name's also quite complicated because technically I'm John Simon Duffy on my baptismal and birth certificate. All the Duffy eldest sons were called John. Um but then because of that, you get known by your second name. So I'm yeah, then yeah, Simon right, John. Right, so right. Uh, And it's been a very complicated thing in life, knowing what to do with the John, move it forwards or backwards. What part of Ireland were, were they from? Simon, do you know? Uh, Donegal way, I think. Donegal. Yeah, I've not been back. I'd like to go back. My, right. my dad and uncles went back a few years right. ago. But yeah, yeah, no, I don't, don't barely know Ireland, sadly, although uh, a few brilliant Irish folk. But yeah, yeah. So you you ended up at Edinburgh University. How how did you come to be there? What were you planning to study, etc.? Well, I studied politics and philosophy, and I think part of the reason was a I'd been to the Edinburgh Festival actually uh, younger, and so I kind of thought, oh, that'd be a really cool place to go. It was yeah. one of the places you could study philosophy, philosophy, politics, and economics to some degree. And I'd failed to get into Oxford to study philosophy, politics and economics. My dream as a young boy, I had well, several dreams, but one of them was to be very involved in politics. And the way you do that in, 
in our broken society is you go to Oxford, you study PPE, and then you join a political party and you get involved in politics. Bit mad, isn't it? But anyway, mm -hmm. I didn't. Uh, I got quite close, but I didn't make make it over the bar uh, to get into Oxford, and so Edinburgh was my next choice. Right. And um, yeah, it had a good reputation for those subjects, and it, I had a lovely time there. It's fantastic because you, as an Englishman, you get to do four years instead of three. You get an mm -hmm. MA. You, and actually, the style of teaching, particularly at that time, was very engaging, very personal. I had some lovely teachers uh, in the philosophy and politics department. So I left university um, having enjoyed academia, but feeling like I needed to do something real with no sense of what that was at all. Um, and I can have a very strong kind of memory of that moment standing in the David Hume Tower, my my favorite professor had said well you could probably go to ucla in america and do a phd or something so mm -hmm. i just stood there and thought about it and, and just thought no i don't know like that sounds good but is that my vision of myself like because wouldn't that just consume you and then mm -hmm. what kind of philosopher would you be if you you just studied uh -huh. way? and so yeah <laughs> then i ended up going to london not really no with no job i'd i'd hadn't I tried to get all these jobs like in the like all the jobs that are offered to you. And this is 1987 at that point, but like be a management accountant with Arthur Anderson. And it's like, you'd apply and you get the, and then they're kind of like, what's your motivation? And I think at that point you say, I want to earn lots of money. And like, I was staring at them. They could, I think pretty sure tell them I had no motivation <laughs> to, to be work for a firm of chartered accountants or management consultants or just didn't interest me at all. But I didn't really know what I wanted to do. What what it's had funny, been isn't the... it? How they, we put a lot of pressure on kids to know stuff that yeah. they can't possibly. So young, so mm. young. Yeah, it's mad. Absolutely. Yeah. What what had been the big influences on you up to that point? Um, I suppose I don't know. That's a good question. Like, I felt very early on in life a belief in God. Uh, actually, so being a Christian has always been a really important part of my life. Mm. So that 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 actually is probably, although I don't make much fuss about it, rightly or wrongly. I mean, that probably is the kind of ongoing bedrock of a lot of things. My family, who have the normal mixture of dysfunctions and divorce and all of that, but I mean, I loved my family and my grandparents on both sides, and and a strong sense of of kind of moral values that I think come through through from those roots. I think, and I loved where i came from um and uh, i i was very interested in genuinely interested in ideas you know so i think that the yeah. mm -hmm. you know the philosophy and stuff is like my brain does tend to kind of run around thinking about these things so like i don't know it sounds a bit weird but like every, when i was at school i started reading machiavelli not so much the thing that's the like he's famous for which is called the prince which is how to manipulate power but his other book was called the discourses well he wrote many things but his other famous book is called the discourses which is a actually an account of how to create a community of citizens in the context of kind of uh, early renaissance italy and um, i just find that stuff fascinating like how what is a just society how should people live together what what are the choices we make and also i suppose a big influence on me was this is a negative thing in a way, but, you know, thinking about things like the Holocaust and how mm. the evil human beings have done. It it still shocks me that we kind of, the, mm. the level of evil that human beings have unleashed on the world and, and then our unwillingness to even think about why we did those things. Mm. Mm. Um, so those kind of things, I suppose, mm. John, very constantly now well they're, they're the kind of things like at a kind of i don't know value level and a mm -hmm. intellectual level they're the kind of constant threads that kind of keep weaving around my brain i suppose so you're you you've had you've got your degree you've been in edinburgh you're down in london you're not sure what the future holds where to go you know probably what you don't want to do but you have a sense no how, how does it how does the story evolve from there which is <laughs> yeah well, for, well so maybe a bit distraction when i was at university 
like um because of this thing you don't you you put information in a computer and it tells you what job you should do and because mm -hmm. i was quite good at maths and things it did say i should be a chartered accountant or something and um, and and then after a few months of being in the real world in london first of all unemployed hiding in a hiding in a cupboard at one stage because i wasn't really meant to be in the flat that i was in um, <laughs> from the landlord uh i uh you know i did those things again and it said i should be a primary school teacher or social worker so <laughs> so i don't know what came out of that process exactly because maybe i am some strange mixture of primary school teacher and accountant i don't know but the <laughs> yeah there's something there but um i ended up working at the natural history museum first of all packing plastic dinosaurs mm -hmm. and then as i was leafing through these kind of careers manuals that you used to get before the internet these massive books i think one of them was called go um graduate opportunities right. i came across public sector management um and the idea of becoming an nhs general manager that was the term at the time it all it all been thatcherized and moved from administration to management and i applied to that and uh, i and miraculously i got on it was a really cool program as well because a lot of the emphasis actually was not on kind of stupid thatcherite stuff but was actually on collaboration about understanding organizations about trying to think about what your real impact was and it was during that training scheme where i'd been and i had at this point i'd been shifted from london to eastbourne which is about as far physically away from where i really wanted to be <laughs> as could be imagined um but it i i visited an institution right um called Leighton Lodge and it was that was real everything for me flipped around that I suppose like I I met people people with complex learning disabilities physical disabilities challenges I I don't know um these amazing people and like I got to the age I think I was 22 or 23 at that point I'd never met any folk like this ever uh, and there they were in basically a kind of modern form of hell mm. that I had no experience of either. Mm. And so I, at the end of my training scheme, I got a secondment to uh, another organisation that was a very early pioneer of community care and deinstitutionalisation, which was then called Southwark Consortium. It changed its name for reasons which are quite interesting a few years later to Choice Support. But... Um, that that was really where I then spent the next almost five years of my working life was in Southwark Consortium, which is a borough in South London. Uh, just the Tower Bridge is at the top of that, and then it goes down to um, I don't know Crystal. Um, what's it called? Uh, Crystal Palace Crystal is Palace. at the bottom of it. it stretches right. down like a kind of yeah. uh, oval shape down yeah. southeast London way. It was, I, that was the place I first met you, I think, um, with a Strathclyde Regional Councillor in tow. That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I remember it well. We went, we had lunch at the pub on the corner um, of Barry Road, I think, yeah. And, and, in Southern Consortium, yeah. Yeah. 1992, three, something like that? Yeah, probably more it's three, not. if I'm guessing, because we started to get, like, the work we were doing was starting to get a little bit of... Um, yeah, um, yeah, profile by then. We've got um, 91, 92, lots of technical changes going on, new legislation. The organisation went through massive change. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually took on all the health services for um, Southwark, all were transferred into Southwark Consortium. And by 93, we were just settling into that and, and, and doing some pretty groundbreaking work at the time. So it's where early versions of personal budgets uh creating small community-based organizations a lot of this work was undone actually by changes that forced on the organization by the local authority eventually but we did the first real test of service brokerage um in Southwark as well lots of really interesting things and, and supported living getting people out of group homes into their own homes um and at that time, I was also working with Peter Kinsella, who just started this 
supported living campaign um when he yeah. was working with the N ndt as it was oh. called then so was peter the link between you two then how did you end oh, up please. i didn't know that you'd met down in england right. before right. you'd moved up I think I don't think I'd heard Simon's name. I think I'd heard about the Southern Southern Consortium, and then got down there. We, we met Stephen Rose. Was he already working with you at that point? That's right. He 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 became chief executive in ninety one. Yeah, I think um, early ninety one. I think, and yes, so Stephen, who's been a good friend over the years, um, was the chief executive and and had steered the organisation successfully through a very difficult period. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, and uh, then had to steer it through, yeah, ma many challenges that the organisation faced. But it, 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 yeah, it survived where many other organisations similarly have actually really struggled to survive because of the pressures of the contracting world and the commissioning world and all of those things. So yeah. somewhere along the, the that road, you've met Nicola, Yes, um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I met Nicola in um at my best friend's Neil's wedding um in Scotland. So Nicola was living in Edinburgh at that time. I was in London, but I'd gone up to Scotland. Um um actually we drove past I've forgotten the name of it now. We drove past it the other day when we were up visiting Nicola's family, uh, the place where we'd we'd met where Neil got married. Um, right. It's up north of Glasgow. Um, actually, discovered weirdly that it's just round the corner from Lennox Town. Oh. I'd never realised how physically close because we just took a bizarre route to get there. Was the place I met Nicola and Lennox Castle. It's very right. odd. Um, like fifteen minutes away from each other. Oh. Um, so n north of Lennox Town into the hills a bit. Into Stirlingshire up that way. Yeah, yeah but kind of on the west side really yeah. and um yeah so we met and we we fell in love dated from a distance within a few months we got married and uh nicola in her madness <laughs> moved down to london yes and so that yeah was quick uh, every month we'd met i think about 13 times when we got married wow from the first time, if you count them up, the, our wedding was like our thirteenth physical mm. time to be together. And then quickly off to America for that Harkness Fellowship. Summer of ninety four for a year, yes. So I got this Harkness Fellowship really off the back of some of the innovations that we've been doing in Southwark, which is fantastic. Um, fantastic opportunity. Went to Denver, but went to school with two kids, Haley and Danny. Danny had Down syndrome. Haley had more complex intellectual or physical disabilities. Um, and um, so I, I went primarily, the plan was to learn about inclusive education. I kind of had this notion that we would achieve inclusion through inclusive education. And, and in a funny way, I ended up coming back thinking, I actually don't think that is worth, that's not, that's not quite right. Partially, I've started to think, education doesn't make much sense the way we do it i ended up thinking like what are we trying to include people in i think it's one of our one of the classic inclusion problems really isn't it it's like you can include people but are you including them in something good and functional or are you including people in something that's a bit broken and mad right. mm -hmm. and um so uh, but i also spent a lot of time writing and thinking about the welfare state disability eugenics it was a chance really actually to deepen my understanding of the the things behind the inclusion movement. I was also very lucky. I've been lucky enough to meet John O'Brien when uh, I was working in London and then um, learn things like the, the PATH training thing. I think the very first train public training was at the TASH conference in Atlanta in 1994. And I just happened to be there with Nicola. And so very early on kind of had already played with it a bit in London, person centered planning, but having that opportunity to learn directly from John and others who were really deeply immersed in that different way of thinking about planning and training, um, very, very useful for everything that came afterwards. And, and then, so from 94 into 95, you find yourself living back up here in Scotland. Is that right with, with 
Yeah, no, there's no guys, Nicola and I are walking around a lake in America thinking, what are we going to do next? I'd given up my job in London anyway. I mean, I didn't want to go back to London, um, so I knew that, but we didn't really know where we want to go. And we just said, oh, let's, you know, we've both had good experiences of Edinburgh. Let's move to Edinburgh. Uh, Nicola's right. family were in Perthshire. Um, so that was the dream. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and, um, uh, yes, and with no job or anything in, in the summer of 95 just returned back initially staying on uh, nicola's dad's farm in perthshire and just turning up and not really knowing anybody um yeah no. just turning up and trying to make connections and first of all i met uh well i did know andy smith who right. from the work i'd done with peter kinsella so i must have set up a meeting with andy he told me about the person said to planning course that Scottish Human Services were just about to start. And I think that, I think maybe just after it had started, I can't really remember now, but I joined that as a kind of co-trainer or um, in some way I was subcontracted by SHS. I think, it, I think it had been going for quite a while. Actually, we did that um, course for over like, three or four years. So, oh, right. Well, then. So some, of, some of the times when you're over meeting John O'Brien and doing that in 1994, I think that was kind of when we were just starting over here um, uh-huh. as a group of people, you know, people coming together from different uh, organisations and under SHS to learn about person-centred planning. So we actually did it over, it was really a long process. That was quite, and you came towards the end of that. All oh, right, yeah. Well, I didn't remember last didn't, year, um... maybe the last <laughs> felt like the last year, maybe the last, maybe that's when did you move over? Well, with 90, I wouldn't have started having anything to do with it until the autumn of 95. Uh huh. So, yeah, so you know, I worked for Richmond Fellowship for three years and was part of that, and then we carried on with that, that group still working after we set up inclusion and or you set up inclusion yeah, for okay. you. So yeah. So it was quite a big influence mm-hmm. for me, but it was how we met. Mm-hmm. That was yes. how we, yeah. Yes, lots of good things, but that was the best. <laughs> <laughs> so Simon came along and he was you were facilitating some of the sessions and then we went off and did a some real work with people, didn't we, Simon, together? Yeah, and in the context of learning, you know, mm-hmm. um, from Simon's mm-hmm. skills, so that's right. We worked with with Nan, didn't we? Do you remember? Yeah, in, the woman that was being supported. Yep. Yeah, I remember it really well. It was the best yeah. learning experience of my life. <laughs> oh, no, it was well, because, well, in terms of person centered planning and the whole, yeah, there's just so much learning about no, the tools are the tools were there to support the outcome that you you know for people rather than the tools were the most important thing yeah in itself you know and I think that was just working with you because I've been learning all about these tools and then you went in and went oh that's really interesting but this is what Nan's problem is <laughs> <laughs> and this is how we how we need to find out how to support Nan and what she's wanting. So what we'll do is we'll do this. And it was it wasn't taking one of these tools and expecting people to fit into that. It was completely you just designed it yourself. But based on all the principles yeah. and values and questions that were useful and all of that. Mm-hmm. So that taught me right at that really early stage mm-hmm. of learning about it, you know. And I, I, I think that's what I do now. The theory, so. theory and practice belong together. Like that, yeah, rather but than it's like separate. the tools are really powerful, yeah. Yeah. and some and they can be used in a really powerful way. But they're, they're not the only, they're not the thing in itself, and they don't. If you're confident the way you were, and I think that's the thing you need to be confident to some extent. But you just kind of you can work out how to get use the tools in a way, reorganize yeah. it, think mm-hmm. differently with them. To get the right outcome for people, anyway. That's no, I I remember that that some that and that happened quite a few times in that when I was mentoring folk that it, not just you but the I've forgotten the guy I went out did a couple of things with, but again the 
like the using there was one example where we'd been effectively i thought set up we'd been basically asked to come into a situation that had been badly managed by a day center and do planning to sort it but what the do planning was was we want you outsiders to help us mend our relationship with the family who were mm-hmm. basically disrespecting in my opinion and 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 in another situation it was a young woman who was really trying to really mend her or maintain a relationship with somebody she lived she'd been moved to edinburgh not really under her own control and wanted to be back on the west coast of scotland with a boyfriend right. and you know like a planning process is a weird way to start a conversation about something as important as that nobody yeah absolutely would do that to, to you would they so it 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 it's so much of it is about trying to really just listen to where people are and understand what your ethical responsibility is at that point. And uh, as you say, planning tools can be incredibly important, especially when the moment is right and people have a calling for it, have agreed to it, see it as an important step in their thinking. Yeah. But as an intervention by professionals into people's lives, it's uh-huh. often disrespectful, I think. And, a bit manipulative. Anyway, you gave me an A minus. <laughs> Did we score them? You scored me. <laughs> I think you were being just funny, but you gave me an A minus for my facilitation, <laughs> <laughs> or or you were facilitating, and I was trying to. Or was that facilitating? I think I was. <laughs> I don't remember. I don't. But you gave me an A minus anyway. It's, it's I don't stuck remember in somebody's that stuck in my that. memory. I thought that, I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> I'm Simon <laughs> Duffy. <laughs> I'd never give an A for anything. Yes. <laughs> he did. Got to keep improving. Don't give me an A minus. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so it just it so happened around about that time we were beginning to get more serious about deinstitutionalisation in Scotland, and my job had been uh, bundled up and recreated as the heading up the process at Lennox Castle and for Greater Glasgow Health Board for, for deinstitutionalisation. And then we I remember you coming to the office and us having conversations and Yeah, trying. the first time was with you and Julie Murray in a Julie did as well. yeah. in a ward that had already closed down at Lennox right. Castle Hospital. And it was then that I realised that I did know you. But that was yeah. only when I walked into the um, into the building to meet you for a... Yes, I think I'd pitched up... In my head, I dreamt that the path I wanted to follow was help close the hospitals and then set up a service provider. And you said to me, Simon, basically, you're too late. You've missed all the jobs <laughs> helping people close hospitals. I did carry on applying for one, I think. I remember you applying for one other one, but I thought yeah, you were I think get, but you Yeah, the Royal Scottish I yeah. tried and didn't get that job. Yeah. Um but you said, Well, what we really need is a service provider. And so we so that was quite early on, wasn't it? Because you know, then we then we engaged in several months of you, I think you can say, but like trying to negotiate some kind of financial and political support for the proposition yeah. I was making. Mm-hmm. And the proposition I was wa- making was initially much more broker- brokerage yes, than what we sold and what we did. Yes. It was it was really much more f- me thinking, well, I could help facilitate things and I could mm-hmm. create a team to help facilitate solutions. Mm-hmm. Um, but as we discovered, you know, that's not so easy when, no. The world's not really ready for that yet. Was it no, no, it wasn't, and I couldn't couldn't get any traction for that at all uh, amongst the people higher up the the chain than, than me. So uh, yeah, yeah. But we were able to get some traction for the more. It didn't turn out to be tra- traditional, but the more traditional route of of starting a new organisation and uh, getting off the ground that way. So yeah. I remember 15th of February, 1996 was when I shook your hand. You said, yeah, yeah, we're going to do it. So I've oh. got that on a little list. That's one of those key dates in my life. 15th of February. Mm-hmm, that was the, the date that Inclusion Glasgow used as its first day, yeah. wasn't it? That was the date. Yeah, that, that we came into existence, if not in any concrete form. On the 15th. We were definitely going to exist from that point on. 
Oh, that's that's well. That's that's a, that's a good point to uh, round up this bit of the story. I think, unless Simon would miss out any major formative events that. Um, no, I mean we could talk about the development of it. But I suppose there's also Francis, isn't there? Then in that, so yes. you know, Francis uh-huh. becomes part. Uh, we've uh, already my meeting of Francis, but again, like again, and probably Francis, I don't really know where you've where you've come from, do I? I mean, I know all sorts of little bits of like, your life history, but not really. And um, mm. so, how did how, where did it all begin for you, like as a human being? And then, how did you get into this? Mm. So thanks very much for listening to the very first episode of the Radical Visions for Social Care podcast. And thank you to Simon for joining us. You can find out more about what Simon's up to now by visiting citizen-network.org. And you can also read a blog version of this podcast on our website. Our website is radicalvisions.co.uk forward slash podcast. Tune in next time to hear Francis tell her story. Bye for now.